turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, this will be verses 18 through 25, a sermon I am entitling The Covenant Salvation of Christmas from Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 25 and this is the word of God to the people of God. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. And this is the word of God to the people of God. You may be seated. Well, even before Advent, we have been on a journey through the Old Testament looking at the Old Testament covenants and how they come to bear upon the person of Christ. We have seen God's promises being upheld despite the moral failures of God's people. We've seen a lot of that too, haven't we? The moral failures of God's people throughout the Old Testament. You know, it would have been a discouraging journey for us if what the Scriptures declared was only telling us about man's inability and man's utter hopelessness. It would have been a very despairing journey advent season but such is not the case because even though the scriptures make that aspect clear that man is hopeless and he is unable to achieve and accomplish his requirements for God's covenant even though the scriptures make that clear they also keep focusing on the faithfulness of the Lord in keeping his promises to his covenant people At every step along the way, through the covenants, we have seen man's failure, but we have also seen the covenant faithfulness of the Lord being declared through the prophets, speaking on the Lord's behalf, and we have seen this over and over and over again. At this point, it should be apparent to you that this covenant journey leads us to a place called Bethlehem, to a stable and with a baby lying in a manger. This is the place of the revealing of the Son of God being born of a virgin, just as the prophets foretold, and the angel of the Lord announced to Mary and to Joseph prior to Messiah's birth. There are many observations that we can make this evening from this text that I read to you from Matthew's Gospel But there are just two that I want to point out that help us understand the fulfillment of the covenant promises of God and how that fulfillment is related directly to Christmas, that original Christmas and the very Christmas that we're here to celebrate, not just tonight and tomorrow, but through the year. Every day should be Christmas for believers. I firmly believe that. I would leave my tree up all year round if Terry would let me. It's just that those trees collect a lot of dust and then critters like to live in them. So we have to take it down and I can't wait to get it back up. But anyway, there are some observations too that I want to make and both of these observations are reflected in the names that are associated with this baby in a manger. The first name is seen in verse 21. If you look back to your text, verse 21, we see here in this verse that the angel says to Joseph, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus 
for he will save his people from their sins. We learn here in this section, in this verse, that his name will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now, remember the name Jesus is derived from the Old Testament name Joshua. And it is a name that is derived from the Old Testament from the name Yahweh in the Hebrew word for and the Hebrew word for salvation, uh, Yeshua, with an E, not an A, a an E. So when you compound Yahweh with Yeshua, uh, you get Yahshua with the second letter changed from an E to an A, Yahshua, and that is how we get the term Yeshua, which in the Hebrew would be for the word or the name Jesus or Joshua. Joshua, as you may remember, was the leader of the conquest in the Old Testament. He went into the Holy Land. He led the people of Israel as they went in, and they were on a conquest to overthrow the Holy Land. Uh, God had given that land to them as an inheritance, and God used Joshua to lead his people and to, to destroy the enemies of Israel. But you may remember on our journey we saw that this didn't happen completely because there was a group of people. Joshua made a covenant with the Gibeonites who, who actually deceived him into entering into a covenant with them. And he was not able, once he made the covenant, to destroy the Gibeonites. God held him accountable to honor that covenant. And then after Joshua died, there were those who did not continue on with the conquest and, you know, go, go all the way down into the corners of the, of the nation and clean everything out. They did not do as the Lord commanded. They didn't finish the job as the Lord had instructed. But Joseph is told by the angel of the Lord that this second Joshua would save his people from their sins. You see, it wouldn't be a salvation that the second Joshua was bringing uh, the, from another nation. In other words, he wasn't going to be coming into the world and taking on another political entity, another people group, another nation. That is not the kind of conquest that the second Joshua would be on. The second Joshua would actually save his people from their sins. It would be a salvation from something that was internal and of a spiritual nature. Jesus would carry out the conquest of the greatest enemy that the covenant people have ever had. And my friends, if you are a believer here tonight, you have not had a greater enemy than the enemy that Christ has already conquered on your behalf. Oh, I know, the old man rears his head every now and then. And you can see the battle that you have sometimes with your own fleshly desires. But rest assured, Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death and the curse forever. Just as sure as I'm standing before you tonight, it would be a salvation that focused on the internal nature of man, of a spiritual nature. Jesus would carry out the conquest of the greatest enemy that the covenant people of God ever had. And this is what this baby would come into the world to do. And it is reflected in his name, Jesus. But there is another name that is associated with his identity that is given in verse 23. As Matthew references Isaiah the prophet from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it is the name Emmanuel. The name Emmanuel. Look back at your text to verse 23 as Matthew quotes from Isaiah chapter 7. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The name Emmanuel is very significant. The name Emmanuel simply means God with us, as the text actually says. It tells us what the name means. God with us. 
But what in the world is going on here? Because, you see, Jesus, the name Jesus and his title being Christ, we see those words attached to him all through the gospel. Jesus Christ. Sometimes he's just referred to as Jesus or maybe Christ. But, you know, that name, Emmanuel, it doesn't seem to stick all through the gospel. His name was not Jesus Emmanuel Christ. That's, that's not his name. His name was Jesus. He would have been the son of Joseph, considered to be, by all those who knew him, Jesus bar Joseph, denoting the idea that he was the actual son of Joseph from a human sense. But here we see that his name also shall be called Emmanuel. His name is not Jesus Emmanuel Christ. But what is, what is the deal here? Is this nothing more than a, like a nickname for Jesus, for something that only his friends called him? No, that, that's not what Emmanuel is about, actually. It was actually a prophetic declaration of identity by the prophet Isaiah that was revealing the essence of his divine nature. That's exactly what it was. In other words, this is not just a child being born with a heavenly purpose to work salvation as reflected in the name Jesus. Nor is this child just the anointed Messiah of God as reflected in the title Christ. But it is a child that will be the manifestation of the divine nature made flesh as being God with us. And in our midst as reflected in the name Emmanuel. No, no one has ever been born in all of history that could ever fit this description except Jesus Christ alone. C.S. Lewis wrote these words. He says, the eternal being who knows everything and created the whole universe became not only a man but a baby, and before that a fetus in a woman's body. But why would the Lord of glory, I want to ask that question, why would the Lord of glory descend to such a lowly state of what theologians call his humiliation? Why would he leave heaven in all the glory and all the splendor of heaven where angels bow before him, where there are actually uh, creatures that are created for nothing but the purpose to give glory and honor to him who is seated on the throne? That's all they do for all their existence to give him glory. Why would Christ leave all that glory and come to earth, born of a virgin, into a stinking stable? I think we need to make those Christmas cards scratch and sniff where you can scratch them and they smell like a stable. It wouldn't be near as romanticized in our minds as, as it probably already is. Why would he do this? Why would the Lord of glory descend to such a lowly state of humiliation? Well, I want to tell you why. Christian, do you remember all those I will references that Yahweh made that undergirded all those apps, all the absolute certainty of his covenant fulfillment? You remember those? And you're probably saying by now, Pastor, how could we forget them? You emphasize those time and time again. Every time we saw them in covenant language, you emphasized them over and over again. We heard them this morning. You were talking about them. You were pointing us to them. You, you reminded us how they all converged on the person and work of Christ. As a matter of fact, Christian, God with us is not the idea that the Lord is hanging out with his people when Christ came into the world, but that he actually came down into the nitty-gritty places of human existence to actually do the heavy lifting on our behalf, that which we could never do. And Christian Emmanuel, God with us, is the prophetic declaration of the I wills of the Lord coming to accomplish what we never could for the glory of God. That is how the covenant glory of salvation 
is on display in that original Christmas. And I want to remind you of something, dear brothers and sisters, the covenant glory of salvation is still on display this very night right here in this room because the gospel is being preached. We are being reminded of what Christmas is really all about and what Christ came into the world to do. And it goes on and on and on. And the glory still radiates today in the lives of those who are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is interesting to me how our covenant journey has led us to the person and work of Christ. And it is our joy to celebrate him on this Christmas Eve and to, to declare the truth of the gospel that sinners can be redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ. For he is no mere man, but he is God in the flesh who came into the world to redeem his people, to reconcile them to him. Oh, my friend, that you might trust in him tonight and in his finished work on the cross for your salvation. May the true gift of the glory of Christmas be yours both now and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the glory of salvation that is on display in the Christ event of Christ coming into the world. Emmanuel, God with us, came to save sinners. The very name Jesus reminds us of that. But Lord, these truths are not just something that we, as the people of God, should embrace just once a year. But it is the very catalyst by which we live out the faith year-round. Lord, may all of our celebrations be reflections of your glory and what you have done. May we never lose the center focus of the glory of Christ, and Lord, how you have upheld your name and the glory associated with it through the finished work of your Son. Lord, if there be anyone here tonight who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that tonight may be the night. That their eyes may be open to the truth of the gospel. That they may truly encounter Jesus as their Savior in full assurance in all that he has done for them. And Lord, that they would rest in the security that you bring as Emmanuel, God with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you are our God and we are your people. Lord, be glorified in our lives, in our celebrations, and in this service. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God for